Next, you'll meet Harvard scientist and essayist Stephen Jay Gould. His new bestseller is called Full House, The Spread of Excellence from Plato to Darwin. The book is about the nature of progress and excellence. Stephen Jay Gould is the author of more than 15 books, including a previous bestseller titled Wonderful Life. He spoke recently at Barnes & Noble booksellers in New York City. Welcome to Barnes & Noble. Uh, I'm glad that all of you could come out tonight. I'm sure, I'm sure that you, it's a, uh, uh, it's such a crowd back there, and I hope that you can hear me all. Can you all hear me? Thank you. And there, <laughs> thank you. I will turn it up louder when Mr. Gould get up, gets up. Uh, I, it is a great pleasure of mine to introduce Stephen Jay Gould since he has taught, taught me so many things and I think taught, taught us all. Uh, there is a, a saying that, that Mr. Gould used once in a preface of his books, uh, of one of his books, uh, which he says is an overused saying, but I like it anyway. Uh, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And I, uh, I, that originally comes from Isaiah, Ber originally comes from the Greek, but Isaiah Berlin used it in his description of Tolstoy. And he said that Tolstoy was a, was a fox who wanted to be a hedgehog. He knew a variety of things in, in various ways, and he kept on trying to unite it into one big thing that he could, but he could never succeed, but that tension was always there. And I, in a way, Darwinianism, I think, is the one big thing that, you, that does the variety. And uh, for me, Stephen Jay Gould has provided a whole variety of things for, uh, for me to look into throughout the, throughout the world. And if you follow through every one of his West, uh, references in his books, I think you'd get, great, get a great education in Western civilization, which is what his books have been for me, a sort of education in the overall, the great variety. His book tonight is Full House. Uh, his books in the past are Ever Since Dar Darwin, Wonderful Life, Wonderful Life, Eight Little Piggies, etc., uh, etc. Et many, many books uh, on his back list. And um, one of my favorite, Mismeasure of Man. So please give a warm welcome to Stephen Jay Gould. Human beings are storytelling animals, and we like our stories to go certain ways. We don't really care much for Ecclesiastes-type stories about all rivers running into the sea and the sea not filling up. They don't go anywhere. We like stories about trends. We love trends, because then either something's getting better and we can celebrate, or something's getting worse and we can lament, and we seem to like to do both with equal frequency, depending on the season. And therefore, I think that so many scientific things that need to be explained, but that need to be explained in the narrative mode as stories, fall prey to a peculiar kind of bias that we don't pay enough attention to. Scientists and historians and commentators of science are very used to analyzing politically based biases, socially based biases, but there's also a form of literary bias in which when, for example, we're saying something about the history of life, which is an intrinsically historical theme in science, we manage to tailor our stories to fit into the kinds of tales we know best. We like to make them tales about trends. Uh, just as one example, which isn't so much about trends, if, uh, if you ever really look in detail at the histories of theories about human evolution, you might think that uh, they and their changes are based primarily on increasingly better data from the fossil record, but so much of the standard way of looking at human evolution is really just a reflection of the standard themes of myths and sagas. We have the hero who's conventionally male, in fact, and until recent feminist critiques, almost the entire story of human evolution was... I'm getting some awful feedback here. We're often just the stories of what men do. You never quite knew where the women were. They were presumably sitting around the hearth taking care of the kids, but you didn't get it in the narratives. But so much of the conventional narrative was the birth of the hero, the hero going out, and it was almost like Parsifal and the 
Red Knight all over again. And so I think that's a very important theme. And what I want to talk about today is the way in which we've had wrong views, and in fact, curiously inverted, not only just wrong, but precisely opposite to the way in which we could find better explanations because of our desire to find trends, and because of our desire to tell stories as tales about trends, individual things moving somewhere, getting either better or worse, we read a whole set of important phenomena quite backwards. Why? Because we don't consider them the way we should, and the way we should is to consider them in terms of full systems, that's the full house of my title, the variation that exists in full systems, and the expansion or contraction of that variation. That may sound very abstract. The talk tonight will be entirely in terms of examples, I promise you, but let me work the abstraction just for another minute. See, what we do when we, I'll give you an example based on 400 hitting in baseball in a moment, but, uh, you know, 400 hitting is, is not a thing. It's part of a spectrum of variation, of batting averages. But when we want to tell, tell stories about trends, what we do is we take a system which has a lot of variation in it, and then we abstract its essence as a single number. We'll look either at the average value, because the average is somehow the uh, closer to the essence of the system. Then we'll trace what happens to the average value through time. Or we might just be more interested in the extreme value. When we study the history of life, I'll show you the errors we make when we consider just the most complex thing at any one moment, because it happens to interest us, because we think we're the most complex things now, which I don't want to contradict. And then we study the history of life as the more greater complexity of the most complex thing through time, forgetting all the time that there's this enormous bacterial mode, which has been the most common form of life ever since things began. So we, what we do, in short, is to take either an average value or an extreme value that interests us, and then we trace the history of that single number through time as representative of the system. That's why I gave as a subtitle the spread of excellence from Plato to Darwin, because my argument is that when you try to abstract the full variation of a system as a single number, that you're really falling into the oldest Platonic fallacy of ignoring variation or considering variation just a set of accidents around an invariable and abstract essence. And our task is to abstract the essence, either as a mean or an abstreme, and study its history through time. Whereas, if you ask what the deepest message of Darwin's revolution is, of, of course it's in. the discovery of evolution is obviously of great importance. But in a broader and more philosophical sense, as many commentators have been saying for a century, in a way the more important thing that Darwin did in terms of larger epistemological issues was to teach us that the, the nature of natural reality is the variation in the system. That is the reality. The abstracted average or the extreme is just something that interests us. The true reality is all the variation. That's it. The variation is not simply a set of convenient measures that we can use to abstract an average. It is the ultimate reality. That's it. That's what evolution uses to change. All right, enough abstractions. Let me uh, present. Let me just start with, with one example and sh show you what I mean. Then I'll get into the two major examples, which are first the baseball one, and then I will talk about progress so-called in the history of life. But let's begin with the evolution of horses, because that's such a classic and we think we know what happens. And I'll show you first the classical slide. This is done by W.D. Matthews, American Museum paleontologist. No, yeah, turn it. They all go in the same way. Just, just as long as, as soon as you get that one right, that's the orientation of all of them. Turn it like that. And they all. We didn't have, I'm sorry about this, this is why we're a little late. We, we didn't have the right size slide projects, so we're going to have to put them in uh, individually. So <laughs> please bear with us. Our apologies. This is the classic illustration of the evolution of the horse. It comes from W.D. Matthew, American Museum of Paleontology in the 20s. When I was a kid in the 40s, this was still the figure that was used. To and this is what everybody knows about the evolution of horses, right? The evolution of horses is the quintessential tale of linear progress. And here you see it, geologically arranged. Horses show three major trends, right? Everybody knows this. They get larger, they get fewer toes, and they get higher crown teeth. So you begin with little Eohippus, so-called, and then you go up to the modern horse. That's the increase in size. 
Eohippus has four toes in front and three in back. I, I, th I'm supposed to be, look, I, I'm supposed to be wearing one that's functioning, is it no, not? It's yeah. Oh, it's all, I'm sorry, I thought, yeah. Okay, that's only, <laughs> sorry, I didn't realize that. My apologies, I'll come back in. Uh, and this is the reduction, this, you got a pointer? <laughs> hey, that's good, thank you. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Three cheers for Mrs. Gottlieb, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I promise I'll give it right back. <laughs> and uh, here we have the reduction of toes from little Hierakotherium, a hip is four in front and three in the back, up to modern horses with one toe. And here you see the increase in crown height of the teeth. And there are the classic trends in the evolution of horses. Now, look, that story is not false in one sense. That is, if you look at the largest horse at any one moment through time, that's what you see. But I call it life's little joke for a particular reason, because it completely misinterprets the evolution of horses. Horses, in fact, I'll just try to tell the story quick. They're going to run out of time. It's, it's in greater depth in the book, which you should buy. Uh, <laughs> The evolution of horses really represents a, a story of utter failure of a lineage that was once very prosperous and prominent and is now just barely hanging on. There are only eight modern species of horses, old Dobbin himself, three species of zebras and five, I guess they're nine, five species of donkeys and asses. Moreover, horses are one of three declining members of a great mammalian order, which was once very prominent, namely the so-called odd-toed undulus, the perissodactyls, which are the horses, the rhinoceroses, and the tapers, all of which are on the verge of extinction. The only reason horses aren't is we've cultivated them. On the other hand, the great success story in the evolution of large hoofed herbivorous mammals is the other great group, the even-toed undulus, the artiodactyls, the pigs, the camels, the giraffes, the, the cattle, the deer, the hippopotamuses, the, that, the sheep, the goats, that great group. And throughout the history of the so-called age of mammals, the perissodactyls, that is the horse group, horses, rhinos, and tapers have been declining constantly while the artiodactyls expanded. Moreover, within the horses themselves, horses evolved in this continent. And at various times in the history of horses, there were as many as 10 to 15 simultaneously existing species just in the western United States. Horses died out in this continent, survived only as a splinter group. I'm going to wait until technology sorts itself out. because you know. Only survived as a splinter group in Europe and much to the Aztecs' distress and Cortez's advantage came back eventually to this continent. Moreover, it's not even clear that there's a, uh... <laughs> you got everything the way you want? <laughs> Do we have it? It, it can evolve, but I'm going to sidestep and, and let it evolve. <laughs> okay, we're going to... Um, where was I? <laughs> Somebody turned on microwave, oh, I see. Yeah, it isn't even clear that there's this pervasive trend to, uh, to these features. Up until a, a few tens of thousands of years ago, there was a very prominent genus named Nanippus of dwarf horses that was no bigger than the original Eohippus. Now, if you replayed the tape of the evolution of horses, and Equus, the modern genus, had died and Nanippus survived, you wouldn't have had any of these vaunted trends, and it could very well have happened that way. But no, you see, there's a real irony in this, and that is evolution is a branching bush, not a ladder. But our models are so caught up in these trend-like ladders that what we try and do is roll a steamroller over the bush. Now, here's the irony of life's little joke, and then I get off this example. And that is that the groups we pick out to illustrate evolution are intrinsically the failures. You see, because we look for groups that have only a single surviving representative, because then we can see it as a culmination or an acme. And that's what the horses are. They were a once enormously successful group that has one living genus. So we can take that one living genus, trace its labyrinthine path back to Eohippus, and call that the grand trend in the evolution of horses. Now, if you look at the real success story, what are the real success stories in the evolution of mammals? Well, they are antelopes, which are artiodactyls, rodents, and bats. I mean, rats, bats, and antelopes, those are the three great groups of mammals in terms of diversity. You never see an evolutionary chart 
of the history of rats, bats, or animals because we don't know how to draw it. All you could do is show a big evolutionary bush with hundreds of modern branches. You see, ironically, it's only the failed groups because we linearize and tell tales of progress. In other words, once, and I remind you in, in closing this example, there's one other very prominent mammalian group that once was at least a modest bush in Africa of several coexisting species, and now also is only one species that might do itself in quickly, <laughs> that we also tend to emphasize in our stories of evolutionary progress. That's life's little joke, that it's really the failed groups with a single surviving representative that we use to tell our tales of progress, and that comes about precisely because we do the wrong thing. Instead of focusing on the full range of variation, which would make it abundantly clear that horses were once enormously diverse and now have one lineage left, instead of doing that, we focus on so-called linear trends by choosing one representative at any one time. So that's an initial example. Let me give you uh, the story of baseball, or a story from baseball. Any baseball fan, because we're all statistical mavens, knows perfectly well that one of the great trends in the history of baseball is the disappearance of 400 hitting. The last person to hit 400 was, as some of you know, and whenever I ask this question, someone will shout it out, was <laughs> Ted Williams in 1941. When he, that was the year I was born. That was a long time ago. <laughs> between, 19, <laughs> between 1900 and 1930, seven hitters achieved averages of 409 out of those 30 years. It was always a, a worthy event of some note, but it was not particularly rare. You just got to put them all in. <laughs> they're in a different order. No, they're not in different orders. They are in the box. They are exactly in the right order, I promise you. No, no don't worry about the dots. They are, I guarantee you, in there in the right order. I pr then get someone else to do it. Okay, they go in in this, in this order. You take them out, just put them in like that. Don't worry about dots. No. Yeah. No, just, just. Now take it out. Now. If you see, if you just. I gave it to you because I, I assumed you were going to stand behind it. Just, just give it to me. Okay. Now, they're all in exactly the same order, okay? Like this order. Stand behind it the way we get this guy to move. Could, could we get one of you to move? We're going to let him sit there. Yep. No. Just need you to get up. Sorry. We're getting there. Hang on. We're almost there. Okay, they're all going to go in just like that. They're all going to be right. Okay. Good. Now they're going to be right. Sorry, our, our fault because we didn't have the right track. We, we got it sorted out. Now, this is just up here to set the mood. This doesn't have anything to do with foreigner hitting. This is up here because every baseball fan will know immediately from internal evidence what great scene on the Yankee fan is being represented here. This, of course, is Don Larson making the last pitch of his perfect game in the 1956 World Series against the Brooklyn Dodgers. I just put you in the right mood. Also to put you in the right mood comes the next slide. <laughs> now they're gonna be right now. They're all gonna be right. But shows me and my kid with the greatest living American. <laughs> we can just leave that there for a little while. Okay, let's get back to the story. Yeah, leave it in there for a bit. We get back there to the story of 400 hitting now. All right, so clearly 400 hitting used to exist. It was always a good thing to do, but it wasn't very rare. And now it's disappeared. Nobody's done it in 55 years. So that's a trend, right? And clearly something's gotten worse. That's one of those trends we lament. Now, the, believe me, and it's documented here, there's an enormous literature on why no one hits 400 anymore. Yet, for all the different explanations, and there are a plethora of varied explanations that have been offered, all the previous literature agrees on one thing that seems absolutely self-evident if you use the bad old model of considering trends as single things moving somewhere, rather than as the full house of variation expanding or contracting. That is, that is one thing the literature agrees on, is that something has gotten worse. That's the only reason wh about batting. And there are lots of different theories. Some people say batting has gotten absolutely worse because people don't try as hard as they used to. That's the giants in the earth tough old Ty Cobb bastard theory of baseball kind of nonsense. Then there are other theories that say, well, it's not that hitting, hitting's just gotten relatively worse. 
compared to pitching, and that's why. But, but they all agree that something about hitting has to have gotten worse. That seems self-evident. How else could you explain it? He was it was very good, and how it doesn't exist anymore about hitting. It must mean something's gotten worse. Too many night games, the schedules are too grueling, the pitches have gotten better, the fielding mitts are larger, they don't try as hard. It, it goes on and on and on and on. But I would like to propose to you that it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, when everything else is improving in sports, and whenever you have statistics you can measure against an absolute standard like a clock you can see the decrease in running times the increase in weights lifted why uniquely should hitting in baseball be getting worse it, it just doesn't make any sense I'd like to I, I want to make this shorter than I meant to because I'll never get to my key example I'd like to propose to you that once you throw out that false way of looking at the story and realize that 400 hitting is not a thing it's not an entity it is just the highest value in a full house, a system, a bell curve, if you will, of batting averages. There are several hundred major league players. They all have a batting average every year. You can draw that distribution of batting averages as a bell curve around a certain mean value, and that, that's the full house. Now, an alternate explanation for the disappearance of 400 hitting, which is correct, by the way, is that no, that doesn't mean my interpretation, that it means that, I mean, it's just factually correct, I don't know if I can doubt that. Namely, maybe foreign hitting disappears because the variation shrinks. On, maybe it shrinks on both ends. Maybe it shrinks around a constant average batting average. Now, if that were true, then you'd say, well, that's a different phenomenon. It's not immediately clear that if foreign hitting has disappeared because the variation has shrunk, that that necessarily means that batting's gotten worse. If foreign hitting has disappeared because variation has shrunk, maybe that means something else. At least you've got to entertain that. Well, it turns out that's true. That is why 400 hitting has disappeared. Moreover, the variation has decreased around a constant average batting average. The average batting average in Major League Baseball has been around 260, with interesting fluctuations that I, I won't have time to explain. This year is, by the way, one of those interesting fluctuations, though no one's close to 400. With interesting fluctuations that are always damped out by judicious changes of rules, the average batting average has stayed around 260 throughout the history of baseball. So it can't be that everything's getting worse in batting. The average has stayed the same. What I would propose to you is that hitting and pitching have continued to improve. They have continued to improve, but in balance. So the average average remains the same. And as everyone continues to improve, and this is a very common feature in natural systems, the variation has shrunk because everyone is now so much better than early in the century that there just isn't as much variation around the constant preserved balance. It's really as simple as that. I, I, I wish I had more time to go into some of the details. Let me run through some slides. I do want to save time for the last example, at least to illustrate the factuality. This is the history of average batting averages through time. And there's been a lot of fluctuation, and there have been some, some serious ones, including a, a rise through the 20s and 30s of mean batting averages. It's always been damped out. And it's always stayed around. This is, this is the one you might want to talk about because fans will remember. This is 1968 when Carl Yastrzemski led the American League at 301. And Bob Gibson had that incredible earned run average of 1.12. But the next year they changed the rules because things were out of whack. They lowered the pitching mound and uh, increased the, uh, decreased the strike zone. And the averages went right back up. So the average has remained effectively constant, and 400 hitting has disappeared because of the decrease of variation around that average. Let's look at the next. Here's an actual measure of that symmetrical decrease. By the way, the diff what I did here is I looked at the difference between the five highest and five lowest batting averages each year and the league average. And you see how that's changed. In the early days of 19th century baseball, the five highest averages were about 95 points above the mean. And now the highest five are 60-something points above the mean. And the same thing is true for low averages. So the, you see the, the variation has shrunk symmetrically around a constant mean. This is the uh, quick and dirty way of doing it, by just choosing the five highest and the five lowest. Though it takes a little time because the baseball encyclopedia doesn't record the five lowest you have to laboriously go through. Let's look at the next slide, which is, is a better way of calculating it. Uh, my research assistant who'd been measuring snails for a month was delighted to get two weeks to compute, to do it the right way, that is to compute the standard deviation of batting averages for all players for every year. I, I knew it would match the pattern I found, but I didn't expect it to be anywhere near as elegant. We ought to focus that just a little. And what we see, is the standard deviation is, is, is a measure, if you will, the average amount of the variation around the mean. 
And uh, these are high values, these are low values. This is 1876, when Major League Baseball started. This is the present. And this is, I, I mean, I knew the pattern would be there because I calculated it by the quick and dirty method, but I had no idea it would be so regular and so precise. I mean, it's like a law of nature. This It just declines and declines, and finally it stabilizes. And there's never any exception. There's every value above 0.5 occurred before 1880. Every value above 0.45 was 19. So down it goes, and there it stays. And the next and last slide is, is the way I would explain this. Uh, this is not mathematics. It's just, it's just a picture. I, I think you, you'll all grant me that there is some limit. I will call that the right wall, if you will, of human biomechanical possibilities. <laughs> that, that is, there's just so much a human body and human muscles can do at our heights and strains. But let's suppose that the very best players, through some combination of extraordinary inborn gifts and great dedication, the very best players are always standing near the right wall. Well, in the old days in baseball, when not everybody was, when no one, when the average was much worse than today, that batting average was still 260 because of the balance between hitting and pitching, and both were worse than they are today. So the average was 260. Relative to the right wall, it was down here. There was lots of variation because the guys who were really good standing right near the right wall, this is the Ty Cobb and the Naples Joie of their days, they're very far from this mean. And you could also be very far in the other direction, because in those early days you could get a job for good field, no hit. You can't today. Well, what's happened today is that everybody's gotten better. So the average, which is still 260, because remember, it's not an absolute measure. It's a balance. The average has shifted towards the right wall. The best hitters, the Wade Boggs, the Tony Gwynn's, they're still standing where they always stood. They're standing where Ty Cobb stood in the 20s, but the mean has moved very close to them. So we don't measure that equal, if not better, performance as 400 hitting anymore. The variation has shrunk as the general level of play has improved. And that is, I put it to you, an opposite explanation from the universal assumption that the disappearance of 400 hitting must record the worsening of hitting. And it is precisely opposite, and to grasp it, what you need to do is completely to revise the standard way of looking at things. Because you have to look at the full house of variation. You have to realize that corner hitting isn't a thing. It's the right tail of a distribution of batting averages. And then you can study the contraction of the system of variation and recognize that this must have a different explanation. Let's move from there to the last example which is the, the largest scale, although look, I wouldn't say the history of life is any more important than baseball. It's a judgment for you all to make. But uh, l let, let's move to that area of my professional competence where the bias of um, reading, of looking for trends and seeing them as single things moving somewhere is, has been most pronounced and most pernicious and most controlling in a negative way towards giving us false views of things, namely the history of life itself where we have, uh, I usually show a lot of slides, and I, I just want to show you a, a few of my last, the most pervasive way in which we show the history of life is as, uh, is as a simple ladder of progress. I'll just show you a, a, a few of, because uh, I want to get to something else. This is, uh, we, we do it, I mean, it's a standard device for humor. It's all that evolution means in the standard iconography. So this is the California version of the evolution of surf trunks through history, and the, and do these pretty quickly. This is the New Yorker's version, of course. Yeah. And the computer industry loves this because their products have gotten cheaper and lighter. So the old chimpanzee was once laden down with an expensive vacuum tube thing, and now a white man in a business suit holds a power book, thereby putting other biases into the conventional iconography. And then we, pop culture uses it too. I mean, everybody uses it. <laughs> And there's a commentary on my least favorite sport. <laughs> and here's some social commentary. Uh, the evolution of man and woman. Unless you, if you think that's a sexist cartoon, here's an antidote for you. It just goes on and on and on. Let's and it's quite international, by the way. Here's the, some of you may know this story. This is, the, this is the Pepsi advertising campaign in Israel a few years ago. And uh, they showed the same 
the same theme. Uh, going from right to left, show you how we encode other violins. It's the only slide I have where these go from right to left. Well, the ultra-Orthodox in Meisharim objected, and unfortunately, Pepsi collapsed, which they should not have done, and they produced this sanitized version of the ad. See, it's okay to show up. It's okay to show cultural change, but not physical evolution. <laughs> Let's see what's next. And then you can make it go the other way. It's still understood. <laughs> this is to the Super Bowl. And uh, th again, these icons are so common that people just sort of automatically use them. There's a, the same thing on another obsession of ours of recent years. And uh, this is my favorite and the last one. This really nails it, that the only way we think of evolution is the linear path of progress. Why is this funny? It's just for, it's education in the Bush-Reagan years, but why is it funny? I, I mean, it's, it's just four monkeys in a dunce cap. In dunce caps, it's only funny with respect to the conventional icon that you don't even see here. I can't give you a better proof that there is a standard way of illustrating evolution. But I want to I wanna focus on something else for this final example, that our whole impression that the history of life must be progressive is based on the same era of the bias that Full House tries to correct. It's based on the era of abstracting one thing at any moment as the essence. In this case, it's the extreme value. The one thing we abstract and take as representative of evolution as a whole is the most complex thing at any moment. Now, it's true. I'm, I'm not here to deny everything. If you take through the history of geological time the most complex thing at any moment, yes, in that sense, if you only look at the most complex thing, sure, it's something you can legitimately call progress. Once on Earth and maybe on Mars, there were only bacteria. You know, then there were simple invertebrates, and then there were horseshoe crabs, and now there are people. Sure, in that sense, I don't deny it. But I do want to claim, in, in closing this, I want to show you some, several pictures first, that, uh, th that this is just a ridiculously biased way of looking at the history of life, it does not indicate that progress pervades the whole, or that there is even a trend towards progress. I want to leave you the thought that, in fact, there is no trend to progress. But first, let me show you not this tradition of the iconography of progress, but a different tradition. I call it high culture's way of depicting the history of life, where what you show are paintings, sequential paintings of the history of life through time. I want to show you the two most famous ones of the 20th century. There's no variation in these. It's always painted the same way. This is Charles R. Knight, great artist of prehistoric life, who pretty much owned the genre until his death in the 50s. This comes from National Geographic magazine, 1942. So this is his first scene. These are invertebrate organisms of the Burgess Shale for the Cambrian. And then we look at the next one. Now, this is the, now he has about 20 figures here. Only two of them show invertebrates. That's a problem already to begin with. Half the history of multicellular life is a history of invertebrates only, but uh, as soon as fishes arise, which the next slide will show, you never again see another invertebrate. Now, that, think about it. Is that fair? Invertebrates don't go away. They don't stop evolving. Fishes are a small lineage, and yet when they appear, invertebrate life is wiped out. Well, you can say you don't care. All I care about is vertebrates, but I think you'll agree, since some of you must be fishermen, that as soon as a lineage of terrestrial vertebrates evolves, then you never see another fish again. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Is that fair? More than 50% of vertebrate species are fishes today. Moreover, almost all of those belong to one group called the teleos, the higher bony fishes. And the higher bony fishes didn't arise or didn't proliferate until the Cretaceous. Cretaceous is well within the dinosaur age. So because they didn't start till then, you never see it. Because as soon as dinosaurs emerge, you don't see fishes anymore in these conventional iconographies. So by virtue of that bias of only showing the most, the thing that, it's not even the most complex thing, the thing that you think is most complex or most human word, you're wiping out more than half of the story of vertebrates. Now, that is not fair. That is not an adequate depiction of the history of vertebrates. It's so oddly skewed use of surrogates to represent the whole history of life of some parochial thing that you think is the most complex because it's on the way to you or something like that. I don't even know what to call it. It's not the history of life. Now, if, if, these, if these iconographic series were termed the march towards man, well, I could say that's biased in lots of ways, but it, at least they'd be saying what they claim to show, but they never do. These are presented as the history of life. Uh, so, as I said, as soon as li land life emerges, you never see another fish and now you might think that this is the exception but it's not 
You see, it's okay to show a marine scene again, but the only thing you're allowed to show in the water are members of the currently dominant group that have reverted to the old environment. There are no fishes here. This is a mosasaur. It's a lizard that's gone back to the sea. You don't show any fishes. Only members of dominant groups that have gone back to an old environment. And then it goes on up its conventional sequence to the mammoth and... And, and the human. Now let me show you uh, one last sequence, and this I love because this is a, a Czech team, Augusta and Bury, and some of you know their beautiful books from the 60s. And if you read the text, it's communist claptrap out of Czechoslovakia in the last days. But uh, it couldn't be more different than Charles R. Knight's quasi-Christian mysticism, but the iconography is exactly the same, and we'll, we'll look at it. There's just no variation. So at least you get three invertebrates in Augustus and Burian, but they had 60, 60 pictures. This is their Cambrian scene. If anybody can turn the lights on, it'd be nice. This is their Ordovician scene, They're going up the geologic column. Their Silurian scene, again, horseshoe crabs. This picture's upside down in the book. <laughs> on page 13. <laughs> I believe, I believe. Oh, now it's even worse here. <laughs> No, I, I just showed that one. Get rid of it. Go to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 was, I, I was making a comment about the book. It, it was right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Cancel that silly side. <laughs> okay. As soon as you get fishes, you never see invertebrates again. Yeah. No, I was saying it was upside down in the book. You, you showed it just fine. <laughs> the book is my fault in the book. Uh, and as soon as you get dinosaurs, you never see uh, fishes again. And, and even if you show dinosaurs in the pond, you don't show fishes. <laughs> And you can have the marine scenes with the mosasaurs and the pterodactyls. Oh, here's a little fish, but it doesn't really count. It's just prey in the pterodactyl's mouth. And, and then you see mammals, and then I... All right, now, now finally, because I'm running a little out of... Give me about two or three more minutes. I want to show you the full house view. And we'll see the last slide, and we'll leave it up. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot there are two. I want to show you that it's not just sort of funny and without consequence, that there are also sometimes rather pernicious political consequences of a false view that you need to tell a tale of human history is a tale of uh, progress. These, this, these are, this is a pre-evolutionary, 1799, a pre-evolutionary English version in the racist mode of going up from Africans to Indians to Orientals to whites to Greek statues as the history <laughs> and the... And, and one more. This is not a racist tract. This is from the leading antebellum textbook of American anthropology, not in Glidden's Types of Mankind. And the same thing, evolution from the uh, chimpanzee to the black man to the Greek statue. So th these can have pernicious content. And now we'll go to the le final slide. All right, here's an alternative view. I just want to sketch for you, and then I'll sit down. And that is this. Let me, let me just, uh, as quickly as I can, give you an alternate view based on the full house of complete variation for why, even though it is true that once there were bacteria and now there are people, I'm not going to deny that, that it is also true that there is no trend in any meaningful sense to progress in the history of life. All right, here's the alternate story, which I think is right. Life begins as a result of the way organic chemistry and the physics of self-organizing systems work, and it begins in the ocean at least three and a half billion years ago. Now, by virtue of the way in which it starts, life has to begin structurally about as simple as it could possibly be. I mean, think about it. You cannot, given the way chemistry and physics work, begin the history of life by precipitating a tiger out of the primordial soup of oceanic chemicals. So the first living thing is going to be right now. Remember I talked about a right wall, the limit of human possibilities? Now let's talk about a left wall, the lower limit of conceivable, preservable complexity in the fossil record. And I would put it to you that when life first originates, that's where it has to originate. That's just a consequence of chemistry and physics. It originates next, near the left wall. You can't get anything much simpler than a bacterial cell, the first kind of thing that's preservable in the fossil record. So that's where life begins, and life is enormously successful. Early in its history, it builds a substantial mode, which is the most common value in a frequency distribution, a bacterial mode. Now, what has happened since then? Here's the interesting point. Well, there's no, there's no room to the left of the mode. I mean, life can go on. Life has been successful. That's the real trend. Life has expanded, but here's your original bacterial mode virtually next to the left wall. There's no room between that bacterial mode and the left wall. 
So all that can happen is, every, since there is room in the domain of more complexity, every once in a while, a small number of species moves somewhat towards the right. Nothing can move much towards the left. And so life's frequency distribution today is what statisticians call the enormously right skew. That is, there's room to have an extending small tail dribbling out to the right. But you know what? The mode has never changed. This is still, you know, you may remember the old textbooks used to call this the age of man, thereby putting a couple biases together. Many people realize that's parochial. A lot of people now like to talk about the age of mammals. If they're more generous, they may say, hey, there are only 4,000 species of mammals and more than a million described of insects. This must be the age of insects. But you know, it isn't that either. We are now living, we have always lived, and we always shall live until the sun explodes in the age of bacteria. That's what it was when life started. That's what it is now. Bacteria are the dominant forms of life on Earth. They live in a wider range of environments than anything else. They have a broader range of biochemistries. You can't nuke them to destruction. They've been around forever. And if they are as common in pore spaces in rocks down a couple of miles into the Earth's interior, then even their weight, their total weight, may actually be greater than all the biomass in the forest trees of this Earth, which has traditionally been assumed to be reasonably. I always thought so. The, the bulk of weight. This is a bacterial world. We can't live without them. They can live without us. They just keep being quiet until we strut and fret our hour on the stage. It's always been <laughs> their world. It is now, and it always will be. But, but we, because we love to spend more attention looking at this parochial little right tail, we, uh, we allow ourselves to think that it's, it's, it's really ours. Now, let me make a final point. Which I think you, you, you might say, well, okay, I understand. That's interesting. I never thought about that. Yes, bacteria are dominant. Yes, the bacterial mode has never changed. Yes, maybe he's right that the most outstanding feature about the history of life is the constancy of the bacterial mode throughout all that time. But hey, look, you know, uh, I, I, I'm me. I'm parochial. I love the right tail because I'm on it. I want to focus on that. At least you will allow me that there is a preferential movement even if most things stay here, I'll grant you that. This truly is a preferential movement. Well, first of all, if there is, and I want to end by saying there isn't, if there is, it's not because things are so good out here. It's only a structural consequence of there being no room in this direction. Uh, right tails will be produced in systems under completely random motion. And let me illustrate that with the standard statistical model called the drunkard's walk, which every teacher of statistics is used. There's no way of issuing, of, of, of representing coin flipping, but I think you'll see it's exactly like this. Here's the paradigm. Man staggers out of the bar dead drunk. And here's the bar. The bar is literally the wall here. And he's against the wall here. And 30 feet to his left is the gutter. Now he's going to stagger absolutely at random, completely at random, no preferred direction. And he's going to stagger five feet every time he staggers at random, along a line. Now, where does he end up every time? I mean, he's going to end up in the gutter every time. It will look like directional motion. But it isn't. The reason why he ends in the gutter is there's a wall here. When it, literally, when he hits this wall, he goes off in that direction. There's nothing constraining him in this direction. Eventually, he's going to get to that gutter. It's like flipping six heads in a row. That's what it is like coin tossing. And as you know, you, you eventually you will do that. He will end up in the gutter every time. This is the same situation. The bacterium is like the staggering drunk. It begins next to the left wall, and the right tail is going to have to develop. Now, last point. That doesn't mean that this has to be a random system. It can develop that way, but maybe there really is a bias. And the only way you can test it is you have to look for the history of lineages that begin somewhere in the center so that they have room to move in either direction. Because then we can make a test. It's no fair starting here, because the lineage starting here can't move to the left. Suppose you start with the first mammal, say, or the first ammonite, or the first horse. See, then they're beginning somewhere out here, so they're free to move in either direction. And as a final point, there have not been many such studies, because paleontologists started getting interested in this problem. But the few stu technical studies that have been made, we try and quantify complexity. There have been studies of the mammalian vertebral column. There have been studies of the suture patterns of ammonites. There have been studies of size in foraminifera, single-celled thing. There are studies of mammalian tooth complexity. And in every single case, there aren't enough to make a generalization, there is no preferred trend towards greater complexity as many species arise this way as that way. 
So it is entirely possible that although when you look at the most complex thing through time, you do go from bacterium to human, that that system can arise entirely as a structural consequence of the necessary origin of life next to the left wall and entirely random motion with respect to increasing or decreasing complexity after that. And that, I think, is a very different way of looking at the history of life. But to grasp it, you have to get rid of the old model, the trends of things moving somewhere, and decide instead to really cash out Darwin's revolution and concentrate on the full house of expanding and contracting variation. Thank you. So what are we doing? A couple minutes of questions and then signing? Yes. Okay, why don't we do questions no later than 9 o'clock and then we'll sign books. Yes. Two Say it loudly so they can hear it in the back. Stand up. <laughs> that's the s same slide I showed? Yeah. Oh, that's the baseball on you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the baseball you right, know, gotcha. What, since the average is the same, these are not really distributions, are they? Yeah. These are kind of, a, a, is it a real symmetrical? Yeah. Uh, you got to yeah. repeat, you got to repeat. Then, then he better stand up. Stand up, stand up. Why don't you Here. repeat? Take a microphone. Question. No, because yeah. never works. Dr. Fool showed these two. Oh. Dr. Gould showed these two bell curves, and uh, the statement is made that the mean batting average is the same at 260. Now, why is this one shifted over? Because, remember, 260, that... Uh, give, me yeah, the give me the microphone. You're plotting two no, because you, you got to remember what I'm plotting on that. Uh, 260 is a measurement of the balance between hitting and pitching. The... Uh, Measurement on the x-axis here is, is some generalized. It is, it's not a. Isn't this the batting? Average? No, no, no. Oh, it's it's a measure of excellence as it approaches the right wall. Well, if this yeah. were the batting average, and this. No, then you would just see. Then you would well, just see the. You, see? Two you would see two. Yeah, because there's no skew on the disc. You'd see two symmetrical curves, the, with the second curve having a much narrower I state see. of variation. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Speak loudly. <laughs> yeah. Let's speak loudly. <laughs> uh, I admire your work, and I, I admire you. Uh, that's obviously a prelude to a criticism, so let's just hear the criticism. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, I think I'm Told it. <laughs> I think I'm in good company. Uh, uh, You're allowed to criticize me when I'm in a company. That's why we're here. Mrs. Uh, Gottlieb, thank you. Stephen Weinberg is taking you to task for... Oh. Stephen Weinberg has taken you to task for uh, retreating from the uh, defense of, of science uh, in the uh, uh, realm of, uh, of, uh, of contradictions with religion. And uh, it seems that you have re retreated from... Now, uh, where, where in would you identify that supposed retreat? <laughs> Uh, in, his, in his book, uh, Dreams of a Final Theory, he refers to a, a, uh, a review of, an, of a book written by uh, a professor from the University of California. Yeah, Philip Johnson. I, I didn't like the book. <laughs> but, uh, you, you seem to say that religion and science are compatible. Sure they are, because they do different things. Now, well, Steve... Uh, Physicists believe, well, uh, I, I have to... Remember the full house of variation? Even among physicists. <laughs> well, that's not true. I don't think you'll find a reputable physicist. I'm one. I don't think you'll find a reputable physicist uh, uh, anywhere who will uh, be, be able to say that science and religion is compatible. I, 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 think, yeah, I think what you're misunderstanding is... Actually, all physicists believe that religion is no, I think, I think what you're missing, uh, that, that, that after all, it's the standard theological position that they're compatible. That's what most uh, liberal theologians hold. The uh, problem with the creationists is they don't hold that. They, they want the whole territory. The claim of compatibility is based on the assumption that, that the domains are separate, that the domain of science is the study of the factual universe and its explanation is the domain of religion is the study of ethics and values. That's why they're compatible, because they do different things. 
And that is the position. I, I mean, I don't mind being attacked for views I hold that are controversial, but that happens to be a view I, I hold that I think is pretty darn standard. And that's all, that's all, I mean. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll make this a private argument later. Yeah. Yeah, could you just say something about um, the, Mar uh, the meteorite from Mars and the uh, bacteria? Or well, it's a, yeah, I, I, I wrote a little op-ed piece in the Times a couple weeks ago. I, I, have, I really don't know whether the report is true. If you force me to bet, I wouldn't put a lot of money on it because there are other ways to explain all those phenomena as, as inorganic. But it's a perfectly plausible case for, for two reasons. Namely, uh, that I I if uh, their reports of age are correct, and, and those have been confuted also or, or uh, argued about also, because life arose on Earth very quickly. By 3.6, 3.5, there was life on Earth soon after the Earth's surface consolidated so that you could have it. Secondly, we know that Mars had running water for the first billion years or so of its history and therefore had conditions suitable for life. Consequently, it's eminently plausible. You have, what you have to realize is there's an enormous difference between life at bacterial grade, which to me is the way physics and chemistry manifests itself on planets in certain conditions, and to put it in a summary way, little green men, which is a result of inordinately improbable and unrepeatable contingencies on any particular, particular planet. I think with respect to the argument of Fuller House and why I was so glad to see that report, is that if it's true, and I'm rooting for it, though I said I wouldn't put much money on it, if it's true, this bacterial mode may not only be earthly, it may be truly universal, because <laughs> I think it even enhances the argument of the importance of the bacterial mode. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, you got your curve from the bacteria, say you live in a world which is bacteria concentrated primarily. That's it. In time, wouldn't you expect since the expansion can only go toward the right, that that will decrease and more and more uh, mammals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, I don't think so because I, I don't think so because I don't know how many spaces there are for mammals. Four thousand species of mammals. They seem to be pretty much most places where mammals can be. The bacterial mode has never gotten lower. If anything, it's probably gotten higher. No, I don't. I don't think it's a question of time. I think it's of the nature of the distribution that this right tail is very small. There isn't a, a there isn't a general concentration of things there. Well, maybe. That remains to be seen. It's possible. Yeah. No, it's possible. I mean, look, it's interesting. Uh, as as, as um, my colleague Dick Lunden put it, if, if um, the Earth is about halfway through its lifetime with respect to uh, the age of the sun, at least some predictions for the sun say it can last another five billion years or so, it is an interesting fact that it took about half the history of the Earth, which is 4.6 billion years old, to produce self-consciousness. That's a pretty long stretch of time, but we got a few billion more years. No, I, I mean, sure. I don't know where it's going from here. One more question. One more question, yes. Hi, um, this ideological shift, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're talking about in terms of random diversity rather than some kind of programmatic plan towards more complexity, that's really r rather fundamental, isn't it? You're saying if we can just think of it a different way. It's almost like the ideological battening man got in the Renaissance when he was told that, you know, the sun stays fixed and Earth goes around it. But here we are supposed to be thinking of a kind of random shift and not a kind of planned progression towards more collective, which we are the fruit or the result. I'm just saying to me, it seems like a profoundly different way to oh, think. And it is hard. The question, we can't hear it back here at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just saying that I thought that what he's asking us to do uh, in terms of thinking of, I guess, the, the trend towards more complexity, which we are the fruit, is profoundly, it's a shaking kind of notion. Um, in a sense, like in the Renaissance, when we were told that the sun stood still and the earth went around the moon, and here we are to think of ourselves, in a sense, as kind of an accident development. Nothing, in a sense, in a kind of continuum of progress. And to me, it's a profound shift of thinking. Yeah, well, you, just, you just said before, in almost an offhanded way, though I think you understand the question of this, think of it this way. And it's, even for somebody who's willing to think of it that way, I'm just saying I think it's a really profound shift of thinking. Oh, yeah, no, I think it is profound, but I think what's... Uh, the reason why I perhaps wouldn't make as, as, as big a claim for it as that is it really is the consequence 
of Darwin's insight. We just never cash it out. If it were a new insight based on a fundamental new theory, what we have is an odder situation. I think you're right, but what we have is an odder situation. Here's a theory proposed in 1859 which carries these implications as consequences, but because of a set of deep biases in the way in which our culture looks at things, we have never really cashed out the implications of Darwin's worldview, and, and that's what I'm asking. Thank you all very much. We're signing books as long as you want. In just a moment, Stephen Jay Gould will be available to sign copies of Full House as well as his other titles. We are going to form one line against this wall with the windows. You may get your books to go, okay, for the first time. First, before you take them downstairs for the okay. first four cashiers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, we, go. we figured it out. Yeah. Colonel David Hackworth and his new book on the U.S. military, Hazardous Duty. It's subtitled, America's Most Decorated Living Soldier Reports from the Front and Tells It the Way It Is.